Thank you so much, Colin. Your dad was telling me this morning that you were singing when you were a baby. Oh, yeah. Everybody have a nice 4th of July? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Something to celebrate. Man. That's right. New nation. <clears throat> Luke 14, verses 15 through 24. I hope you guys can see. Well, I guess maybe. <laughs> oh, That's why we moved this back here. Yeah, we got it in the book, too. Luke 14, 15, verses 15 to 24. An invitation to a banquet nobody, nobody would want to miss. Let's read the text. Hey, it helps to get there first, though. <laughs> And when one of those who were climbing at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, Jesus speaking, a certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider my, me excused. And another one said, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported to his master. Then the head of the household became angry. And said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done. And still there's room. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways along the hedges and compel them to come in. That my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And Isaiah 53 describes Jesus, our Lord and Savior, as a servant of the Lord, the Messiah, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. The New Testament account of his life bears that out. While the scripture says that he wept, in Luke 19, 41, and in John eleven thirty five, 35, that Jesus grieved in Matthew 26. I've never found any indication in Scripture that ever said that Jesus laughed. He told some very sobering stories and even used sarcasm. And there's no record that he ever said anything to cause laughter. And yet the story that he tells here today in this passage of Scripture seems like a joke to those who heard it. It would have appeared to them as ludicrous, ridiculous, impossible, totally inconceivable. A joke without a punchline, as Jesus tells this parable. No one invited to a banquet had, would have dreamed of refusing the invitation. No one. Not only that, but no one of important social significance would invite the dregs of society to fill a banquet hall. <coughs> so let's pick up where we left two weeks ago. Jesus is still in the Pharisees' home where he had a Sabbath day meal with them. And the trap that the Pharisees had set for Jesus backfired on them. And Jesus exposed their hypocrisy and their pride. And they were speechless. The scripture says they could say nothing. And in verse 14, it says, and you would be blessed since you do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And hearing that statement, obviously, they did. They understood that Jesus was referring to eternal life, but challenging them to humble themselves to receive it, and earning that resurrection in the kingdom of God was their supreme hope. That was their goal. That was their mission. You see, they believe that by following these minute prescriptions, 
of depriving themselves of certain things, keeping the rituals of their religious system, that they would gain eternal life in God's kingdom without Jesus. All false religious promises a good life after death. All false religions promise that. You put up with these certain restrictions for a while and burdens that impose on you for a while, but in the end, you're all going to be with the Lord. In our world today, in progressive Christianity, as it's called, by lowering the view of the Bible, by addressing our feelings over facts, by refining biblical truths to fill our whims. The doctrines we grew up with are now and after all, talking about hell is so offensive. You get it? And from verse 15, it seems like our Lord's reference to the resurrection of the righteous at this banquet wasn't lost on our guests who thought of their great future and glory with God. Look at verse 15, and when Pharisees who's reclining at the table with him, heard this, heard what Jesus said. Just as everyone a toast, we made it. Blessing themselves. Also sharing in this unspoken rebuke of the Lord's declaration that they were too proud to enter. They're saying, no, we're not. You just said it. They ignored again and again and again. Proclaiming their ancestry. Hey, we're from the tribe of Abraham. We got it made. Not only did they fully expect to be in the heavenly feast, but they wanted their seats of honor. Today, in our culture, nothing else would have been said. You wouldn't want to burst these guys' bubble. You wouldn't want to damage their little psyches or their egos. But our Lord Jesus Christ never, never encouraged anyone's false sense of security. He never did that. And so this arrogant, misguided assumption called for an immediate and unmistakable correction. Jesus always, always pointed to true evangelism to expect heaven while rejecting Jesus Christ and his gospel is the most deadly and serious of all false hopes. So Jesus again begins to correct these scribes and Pharisees in their thought process, their delusion of their self-confidence by telling the parable 24. Here's this invitation. A certain man not just any dinner, a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready. This big dinner, many are invited. Obviously, this host is extremely wealthy to afford such an event like this. were sent out. Put it on your ears. Come in this famous day. Those who would come, don't forget. Don't forget. A personal invitation saying, hey, don't forget, it's tomorrow. Come. Come in the present imperative tense. This is a command. Come. Come. Everything is ready now. All the preparations are done. The food is ready. The fun, the excitement, the entertainment. Please come. Come. There's the invitation. And then in verse 18 through 20, here are the excuses. But they all alike began to make excuses. Began to make excuses. First excuse, what is it? I have bought land. I need to go look at it. Really? <laughs> Talk about a joke. Really? Who in that period of history would buy land without looking at it? I mean, now you can have a drone fly over it or whatever, but not then. Nobody would buy land without looking at it. But they're asking for, please, please excuse me. <laughs> what a flimsy excuse. And then the second excuse here, verse 10, I bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Again, trying out newly purchased oxen, is that absolutely essential? 
you can't go to this dinner that you've been invited to for who knows how long? In fact, if you can purchase five yoke of oxen, that suggests that this individual is pretty well off. He could have one of his servants do that. And then the third excuse. I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. Now, there is no offense. But given this view and period of history, women didn't have a voice like that. Pharisees would have found this excuse the most ludicrous of all. You got married, so you can't come and eat? Really? How silly is that? In the first century, women did not dictate to their husbands what they could do. <laughs> and nor could the Old Testament exemption from military service or other duties for newly married men be used as a valid excuse for not attending a banquet. So what does the host decide to do? What does he do next? Look at verse 21 through 23. Here's the inclusion. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry and said to the slave, go, I mean, he's angry, go out at once into the streets and the lanes in the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, and the blind in the land. Now, obviously, the host decided too much work and time has gone into this. Too much expense is involved. This has been prepared for a long time. So he sent his servant out to bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And boy, that would be a hard task to do, wouldn't it? You know, they don't even have the means to get there. And so he's going to try to get them there to show gratitude. They can't even express gifts back to this host. So the slave did what he was told to do. And look what happens. There's still room. Don't you love that? In God's kingdom and his feast, there's still room. Always room. So the host said, go out into the highways along the hedges now and compel them to come. That word compel means to force them. You're going to grab them. You're going to start bringing them in. So that my house may be filled. Bring in those who have no home. Bring in those who live out by the trees in the bush. And there again, this is going to be time consuming for this poor servant. Would you like to be in his shoes? I got to do this. How's this going to happen? This is even harder than it was before because what are these guys in the bush going to say? What is this? A trap? Why does he want us to come? Is your boss Looney Tunes? Does he know we can't pay anything? We don't even have the clothes on our backs all we have. That's why we're living out here in the bridge. Friends. That's verse 24. The exclusion. And Jesus said, For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. None of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. That phrase, I tell you, is used over 13 times in the Gospel of Luke. And every time that phrase is, you better get this. And this is a signal. You see that passage, I tell you. So let's apply this parable. Who's the certain man? The head of the household represents God. God Almighty. The banquet in his eternal kingdom. The banquet. These pre-invited guests was Israel. The first invitation was delivered by the Old Testament prophets to them. The people said, yes, we want to come. We want to be there. We're planning on it. We want to enter the kingdom of God. And then they killed the prophets. The dinner hour has been given. Jesus called this the favorable year of the Lord, the dinner hour. It's time. Everything's ready. And then the second invitation is delivered by the apostle, or John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Everything's ready. Come. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. They wanted to be a part of the kingdom without Jesus. And they killed him. And like the invited guests, they offered foolish excuses. Two with material possessions involved, and one with the relationships. People and possessions. What keeps people from coming to Christ most often? People and possessions. People and possessions. 
my stuff, my stuff, my people, my relationships. God's not going to approve of this. I can't come to the Lord. Look at all my stuff. That's why Jesus would say later on in Luke 14, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So none of you can come and be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. And Jesus is not telling us you've got to hate your folks or your brothers or your sisters. He's saying, but I've got to be first. I have to be first in my relationships. God has to be first. The kids did a program, the BBS, a year ago. He's first or second. Is that the way it is with you and me? Everything and every relationship is second to God. Amen? Amen? And if you reject God's invitation, He will reject you. They're not even going to get the taste of this dinner. Nothing. Jesus has made it possible for all to come to his banquet. There still is room, praise the Lord. God has prepared a place for those who love God. The things that eye has not seen or ear has heard, we can't even imagine the glory, the majesty, the room that's prepared for his children in heaven with him. If you haven't said yes to Jesus' invitation, will you to do it today? Will you today say yes? I'm not putting this off any longer. I want to be a part of that feast, that banquet that Jesus has invited me to. Decide today. Repent of your sins today. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior today. Follow and obey his word today and turn all your wants, all your wishes, all your dreams, all your goals over to him today. Today. Today's the only day you have. We can't count on tomorrow. And I'm not trying to tell you that to scare you, but you got to consider that. After 9-11, the attack on the Twin Towers the search and rescue teams searched through 22 floors of debris from those tall towers, 97 plus floors down to 22 pile, looking for bodies, looking for people. And they found some. It was over almost 3,000 people eventually died because of that. But they had a memorial walk if you've read the book, God at Ground Zero, they had a memorial walk out there where people would write cards and letters and notes to family members missing. And this little eight-year-old boy <coughs> left a note. And here's what he said. Yeah. If I'm ever left in a deep, dark hole, I hope you will be my hero and come find me too. You and I both know there are a lot of people today they are not under 22 floors of rubbish, but they're living in a deep hole. Whether it's depression, whether it's frustration, whether it's anger, whether it's unforgiveness, whether they think it's too late. God can't save me. I'm here to tell you he can. And he will. And he's still searching for you. He's still looking for you. He still wants you to come to him. The Lord doesn't want to leave anybody. Anybody in a dark, deep hole of sin and death. He wants to save you. He's prepared a banquet for you. And he's invited you. And he's made all the preparations. All he asks you to do is come. Come. Pray with me. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we're so thankful, Lord, for your promise and your word. Forgive us, Lord, for today in our culture to try to change your word. To write, rewrite it for our whims. 
for our wants and wishes. We put ourselves on a pulpit, a platform, instead of you on that platform. Father, help us in our walk with you today, in our generation, the world we live in today, to have that influence, to share your love, to be kind, to be loving, to be forgiving. And for those brothers and sisters of our faith and our movement <coughs> and other movements that don't know you, help us, Father, to reach out to them. Help us to be your hands and your feet as that rescue team which searched through debris of dust, ashes, papers, computers, all kinds of stuff looking for some light. Father, you do that every day. Every day. It's a 9-11 every day for you. You love us that much, and you keep right on doing it. So, Lord, help us in 